Can't promise we'll get out by five, but I'll do my best to be just maybe a little after that. Um, I'm only covering 106 years of history, so it, it should go by fast. Um, so what I've kind of been working on the last four or five years now, actually, is kind of trying to get to line combinations for every team in the NHL, uh, kind of for their playoffs or end of the regular season. And uh, one of the things that I, I wanted to use when I was starting to work on this was that uh, the, the NHL guide has a roster size information in their mail, uh, major rule change section. And as I, I'm sure all of you know, the NHL is always right. And so I figured that I would just, you know, kind of block that out with their rules. If you go to the next uh, slide. Whoa. Wow. That might be too small to see. Okay. Um, so this is the 1986 uh, official guide and record book. This was the first one that I found that had a list of major rule changes. And in that section, they kind of list out the various roster rules over time. And uh, they carried that section of the book right till the end of its publication. And I'm pretty sure the same rules are still available on their records website today. As I've been going through my work, and I rely on the NHL.com's game-by-game uh, -game summaries as a big part of this, um, I found that the, the rules weren't at the, the listing in the rules weren't actually consistent or correct with what was going on. So I figured this is sort of an insight to what I'm working on and uh, we can kind of walk through that. So I'm going to kind of discuss what the rules were and then have some sample rosters over time to show how those rules would affect the game and, and vice versa. So if we go to the beginning, pre-1925, we got Aurel Joliet there and uh, in Les Canadiens he says, well in those days six men played the whole game, which was uh, figuratively true, if not quite literally true. There's no record in the guide before 1925 of what the rules would be, but teams tended to have nine skaters uh, on a roster through that period up to about 1923, and uh, the, the top players would play most of the game, and the spares would kind of be slotted in. You didn't see too much roster tran uh, turnover from game to game or season to season because of the amateur rules that were in place in those days. I think it was mentioned this morning. Uh, if you played a game professionally and you weren't good enough, your career was over. You couldn't even get in a beer league. So, uh, you know, they tended to, if you had nine skaters, if one wasn't available, you'd go to eight and then you'd go to seven. You might see a game where you might use six. I didn't see only five. I always saw at least one spare. But I did see that two teams of this era use less than nine skaters every game. The 1920 Quebec Bulldogs were a, a fairly weak team. Uh, the 1919 Ottawa Senators were not a weak team. So if we go to the next uh, slide, this was, uh, this was this team. And if you look at that, eight skaters plus a goalie that they were using in the playoffs, every single player made the Hall of Fame. So that's obviously quite a strong roster. Um, you can see that they didn't really have a second center. Uh, Eddie Girard had played some forward, particularly early in his career. He could shift forward if they needed. George Boucher was a Hall of Fame defenseman, starting his career as a forward. So you'd kind of, if, depending on what you need, you'd just move the players around uh, with this sort of thing. You'd think if everyone on your team was made the Hall of Fame, you'd win the Stanley Cup, but this was one of the years they didn't. They lost to Montreal 4-1 in the final, and this was the, the year of the influenza, so there was no champion that year. If we go forward now to when they first do list the, the rules, we see that uh, we see that the, the first set of rules says a maximum of 12 players for each game from a roster of no more than 14. That's in 1925. The NHL had started to use more skaters leading up to this period, 10 in 1923. The Maroons were the first team that I saw the season before dressing 12 occasionally. Um, now, you know, the rule says 12, NHL.com shows the game from that season where they actually dressed 13 as the New York Americans. I've got Burt Corbo there. Um, he's not listed in the newspaper requests. I think that NHL.com is probably wrong here, but uh, I wasn't at the game, so I can't really verify that either way. Uh, as we go in, you know, in 1926, the Western League folds. They go from 12 major pro teams down to 10. You'd think the roster sizes could increase, but at the same time they added minor pro hockey. So that gave players another alternative. They could send the players to New Haven or, or Springfield uh, eventually. 
and call them up when they needed them, so they didn't need to carry every player that they had rights to. If we look at the 1926 Pittsburgh Pirates, that if the Pirates are famous for anything, it's that they're the first team to use two regular forward lines. Uh, you can see that uh, Lionel Conacher and Roy Warders were the big stars. But, you know, in this room, I'm sorry, James isn't here, but, uh, you know, Hib Milks was the star first line forward on this team. And uh, they were the first team to use two set lines. They used them for 10 to 15 minute shifts through the game to try and counteract the fact that their players were a little bit less uh, starborn than, than some of the opponents. Uh, the third line of players there with Berlin Kett and Clegghorn were not really a third line. They were spares that'd be spotted in occasionally. Clegghorn is actually the coach, so I don't think he played more than a game or two. Uh, through the year. The next big change for hockey is 1929 when they start opening up the forward passing rules and uh, the rules uh, begin to change as well. So in 1929 they go from 12 to 15 skaters and then in 1932 they're uh, reduced to 14 from 15 which you could imagine being a depression uh, uh, result because you couldn't carry as many players and pay that many players. Um, the one thing that you'd see with forward passing, the game speeds up, so now you can't run out, certainly forwards couldn't run out uh, 55 minutes a game, you needed to have two forward lines, and they started to even introduce a third line into the early 30s. So you can see teams generally using 12 or 13 skaters, and then moving to uh, 14 in, uh, by 1932. I did see a list of exceptions here. Um, according to NHL.com, some of them the papers agree with, some of them uh, they don't. The one thing I thought was neat is the last game of the regular season, if it was not a game that impacted the standings, it was kind of a free-for-all. Like they might introduce test rule changes. Uh, they seem to have uh, extra guys. If you want to use them, use them. Bill Cook's last game, I think they just brought him in as a Bill Cook night kind of thing and they just let him have an extra player, which is, uh, I don't think they do that today. I've thrown in the uh, New York Americans and uh, I probably should have picked a less obscure team, but I like the Americans. Pat Adams has already been mentioned twice. He's the first line left winger here. And so this is a, a, an early example of a three-line forward group. Uh, Birch and Himes lines would get most of the ice, but it is a designated third line that would play together now in the, uh, the early 30s for the Americans. And you can see Duke Dukowski is sort of a utility. He'd play off some on defense and some on forward to try and bridge the gap. Because at that point, you could still get away with uh, players like Eddie Shore playing on defense pretty well the whole night. If we move forward now to the pre-war era, the guide would say that in 1938, the rosters went back up to 15. Now, I saw evidence that Detroit was actually using 15 the year before. And then also it's pretty clear that they only used that rule in 1939 because of the following year everything's back down to 14 skaters again so this is one that the guide seems to have missed um, but you're clearly now seeing that four defensemen nine forward and then however many spares you have access to at the various points that, that's what you needed to run a hockey team i think they mentioned in the eastern league you'd start with 13 and you might lose guys as uh as injuries occurred but that was the that's what you needed to to play in the NHL. I've got the uh, 1940 chanting uh, New York Rangers as our sample for this era. This is the first championship team where they've spread the talent across all of their lines. So they've got a Hall of Famer on their first defense pair and their second defense pair. Hall of Famers on the first forward line, second forward line, and two on the third forward line, which I'm not maybe I got the lines in the wrong order there, but uh, that, that's the first team. Before that, you'd still see, you know, your uh, uh, Charlie Conacher's line. You'd, you'd have your stars on the first line and, and your defensive players after that. If we go to the World War II, it's a big change, obviously, to the world and to, to hockey. Um, and it certainly affected how the game was played. So the guide, again, just has one reference through this era, and it says that the player limit was reduced to 14 in 1942 and that a minimum of 12 was abolished. Now there's no mention of when and if that, that came in. The poorer teams may have been using 12 or less uh, along the way, but during the war there was a lot of volatility in your rosters. Players would come and go based on military restrictions from year to year or throughout the year, and uh, so they had to pare back the rosters. 
And in November 1943, they mid-season lowered the, the, the roster level to 12, uh, which is the lowest it's been obviously since uh, the, the 20s. And then the following year it was uh, set to 13. And then finally when the war was over in 45, they went back to 14, which is what it was before that. So I've got, this is the 44 Maple Leafs. This is the year before Frank McCool won the Stanley Cup for them and upset Montreal. But it's uh, interesting in a couple of this is their playoff lineup. And I, I mentioned here that Bud Poyle was playing on the first line at the end of the regular season. And then he was called up to the military and that was that. And they had to shuffle their roster to accommodate that. And then not sure if, how many 1940s fans we've got in the room, but basically, you know, half of this team were regular NHL players and the other half were amateurs that were kind of filling a, filling a breach for the, the group. Ted Kennedy there is a second line. He was an 18 year old that year and it was his first uh, full season. Played very well, but not the, not the main star on the team that year. They lost to Montreal in the semifinal and the Canadians had one of their dominant, dominant teams that year. So we move forward now. We've got uh, post-war, and uh, again, not much in the guide. They say in 1949 uh, that you began to be allowed to dress 17 skaters per game, and uh, the last reference in the guide was 14. So it was 14 to 17. In actual fact, it was 14 and 45, 15 and 46, 16 and 48, and then they tried 17 for a couple years and backed it down to 15 in the early 50s. I think there was this tug and pull between the rich teams and the weaker teams because the uh, a team like Toronto wanted to have the roster spots. They had players that they could use in the breach, whereas a team like Chicago, not so much. And so there was this you know, pull and uh, push and pull between uh, how many players you, you'd get to use. Uh, certainly you're using three lines for defense with some spares. The Leafs were an example of a team spreading their wealth. They had the three Hall of Fame centers here uh, in their dynasty years of the late 40s. I've got an example of uh, the 1950 Detroit Red Wings. I kind of included this because the, the research I'm doing, I'm trying to find the best fit for a roster for their playoff year. Uh, what would the lines most look like? And this was a mess for me because uh, Gordie Howe suffered a fractured skull in game one of the playoffs against Toronto. And that just threw their roster uh, all over the place. So the Red Wings actually used 23 skaters over the 14 games they played. You could use up to 17. Uh, Red Kelly played most of the Leaf series as a forward. They used him on defense uh, in the final against the Rangers. Um, you know, they had call-ups. Marcel Pronovo is there as a Hall of Famer, but uh, he was a rookie call-up that they just kind of brought in at the end of the season. And, uh, you know, with, with this team, you think of the, the Red Wings as Sawchuk and Del Vecchio and Metro Christi and those guys. But this 50 team, really, other than the production line, uh, is, is kind of a, a mixed bag of players that uh, aren't, aren't quite as well known. I guess probably because it's pre-television, I think would be one reason. But, uh, but there you go. So that's my best guess of uh, how they would have uh, set up the team. So we're going out to the original six. And um, uh, several rule changes you can see listed here. They were trying some different things, different player, more players at home than on the road, more players between 19 uh, or before December 1st and after December 1st to allow some tryouts early in the season and kind of very, very volatility between using 15 or 16 or 18 and then back down to 16. And you can see the, the number of goaltenders, the first time you were required to use two goaltenders was listed as the 1965 regular season. Uh, in actual fact, it was the 65 playoffs, so they kind of got that one wrong too. Um, so here we've got what actually was happening in the Riddle of Six is like quite a bit more of a mess compared to what they have in the major rule changes. I think they kind of got bored in about 1957 and thought, well, let's just let them do whatever they want. We'll pick it up again later. So uh, they're, they're, they're right until about 56. And then you can see some years they would use 17 or they might use 18 early in the year and 17 or 16 in the regular season and 17 in the playoffs. Um, the guide mentions it was 60, it was 1960, 61 that they used 16 skaters. It's actually 61, 62. 
And then uh, for the glory days of the Leafs, it was 16 in the regular season, 17 in the playoffs. But of course, if you've used 16 all year, your 17th guy is probably not getting a lot of ice time in the in the playoffs at that point because he's wouldn't have been used that much during the year. So I've got a, a typical original six lineup here, the 61 Blackhawks. Uh, obviously, this is pretty clear. Four use four top defense when they get regular ice time. Al Arbor's a spare. Two fairly well known scoring lines featuring Hall and Makita, and then the, the the rest of the players primarily taking on a checking role, even if they've been scorers at other points in their career. Litzenberger, Todd Sloan, uh, Reggie Fleming, again another example of a utility player could move from uh, defense to forward as, as needed. So, go up now, expansion. There's no mention of any changes in the guide, and this is where I really started to realize that maybe following the NHL's guidance wasn't the best course of action, because I was really thrown for a while here. But uh, in 68 and 70, they used the same rules as the original six days. In 69, they had 17 skaters, and in 1971, they actually used 18, both in the regular season and the playoffs. Like the, the 71 Canadians would be an example of the first cup team to have 18 skaters. Um, and I don't know why they had such volatility. They can't make up their, their minds here. Another team I struggled with with my research is a team like the 69 Blues. Uh, it's obviously the strongest expansion team of that era. They went to the final. Um, but in trying to build a roster, Doug Harvey was one of their regular defensemen, was injured just as the playoffs started. And again, they had to sort of shuffle how they were going to uh, set up the team. Now, fortunately for Scotty Bowman, I don't know if Jimmy Roberts was his favorite player, but I kind of feel like he might have been because Roberts seemed to follow Bowman throughout his career and then had him as, as coaching in Buffalo there. But Bowman was one of the first player coaches one of the more recent coaches to try and have a utility player available. And Jimmy Roberts is maybe the best example of this, uh, playing defense, playing forward, but he had Rick Chartres in Montreal, Lindy Ruff, he converted to a forward in Buffalo, uh, Sergei Fedorov, Matthew Dandino in Detroit. He was always looking for a way to build roster flexibility. I've reflected Jimmy Roberts here on defense, but there's record of him playing forward, sometimes playing penalty kill, he'd do both within one penalty, so I don't know, we're, we're all over the place, but um, another one that I find it, an interesting team from that era. So we move now, we finally get to the 70s. From a, a rule standpoint, we're, we're finally coming down where it, it makes sense here. Uh, the, the rules are set at 17 skaters plus two goaltenders, and that was kind of it for the 70s. Uh, teams had to choose between dressing six defensemen or 12 forwards. Uh, they would alternate based on their roster construction. The one thing that I learned though is that the weaker teams um, tended to maybe carry 18 skaters, especially once the WHA started and the roster depth and the minor league depth was stripped away. They would maybe pick 18 skaters, six defensemen, 12 forwards, and you know use 17 of those 18. And then a guy would get hurt, and then they'd use 17 of the 17, and then he'd be down to 16. A team like the Seals here would use uh, 14 or 15 guys. Not every game, but you know, if they didn't have extra players available, they weren't going to find them. And uh, quite a few of the weaker teams through the 70s uh, had to do that. And when you imagine the Montreal Canadiens are definitely dressing 17 against you, you can see why they would um, not lose very often. My example for the 70s is actually from 81. Because I, I imagine the 70s being a time of a bit of, of physical violence and a time where you'd start to see tough guys playing in the bottom of your lineup to respond in case there's trouble. So the Philadelphia Flyers, this is the highest penalty minute team from the, the 70s and early 80s. And I was like, all right, this will be perfect. I'll show how they had tough guys at the bottom of their lineup that could step in. And then I discovered that the, the bottom of the lineup on forwards was Rick McLeish and Reggie Leach that year uh, because they were actually playing the tough guys on the regular shift and it was only if they needed scoring that they would move the guys up to, to spot check them. And, uh, you know, this year Pat Maroon led the NHL with uh, 150 penalty minutes. This Flyer team had seven guys that had 150 penalty minutes. Not, not all of them listed, a couple of the extra defensemen that weren't on there included in that. But, um, you know, at this point, Rick McLeish was still a very useful player. He scored almost a point a game in this sort of flex 
role being uh, not on a regular line, at least in the playoffs. Reggie Leach had a good regular season, but this was kind of the end for him. He didn't get a point in the playoffs and was out of town uh, at the end of the season, I think, or, or shortly thereafter. So we finally come now to 1982, which is the last time they, they made a, a roster rule change. And it's, uh, it says here, at the beginning of the 82 season, the number of players in uniform set at 18 plus two. Uh, however, they actually instituted that rule in the 82 playoffs. Again, I don't know why you would make a change just for the playoffs, but I've, I've got a picture here of uh, John Tonelli scoring a goal for the Islanders, game five against Pittsburgh. And uh, if you ever have a chance to see that game five, it was a deciding game, Pittsburgh and the Islanders, middle of the Islanders dynasty, and Pittsburgh had the Islanders up two goals with about six minutes left. And uh, the Penguin strategy had been basically to play two lines. They had, I think it was Mike Bullard's line, and then Kevin McClellan and Andre St. Laurent were checkers. And they just played two lines for like the whole game, which obviously in our day and age is difficult. And sure enough, you know, they had the lead, but in the, the dying moments, the Islanders came back, tied the game late, and then scored the overtime goal. Because if the Penguins hold on, that changes a lot of history in terms of what we think of as the, the Islander dynasty. Um, I just also want to say, at first you had, uh, they didn't know how to use that 18 skater. The seven defensemen model with seven defensemen, 11 forwards, it was more common at first before they discovered that having four lines that could play uh, together was actually a useful strategy. So my, my last two examples are exceptions to the six defense, 12 forward rule. The first one is the 83-84 Montreal Canadiens. This team made the conference final, um, and it was uh, Steve Penny, quite famously, came from nowhere to be the, the star goaltender that year. But this was one of the very rare teams to try and use five defensemen and 13 forwards. Uh, the, the most recent that I've seen in the playoffs trying it was the 97 St. Louis Blues when they had McInnes and Pronger. <laughs> Obviously, this Canadiens team had uh, Robinson and a rookie, Chris Chelios. Uh, you see the 60 Leafs actually played with four defensemen in the playoffs and 13 forwards the one year. But Red Kelly is one of their forwards, so if trouble happened, if somebody got hurt, he could have stepped in. Um, now, the other thing, of course, with this team is that the 13th forward is Guy Lafleur. And, uh, you know, so again, the Canadians used a variety of lines through the, that playoff run, but generally, Jacques Lemaire had Lafleur as the 13th guy. From, from everything I could say and just spotted him in and he wasn't very effective and obviously that was the, the beginning of the end of Lafleur's career in, in Montreal. But uh, yeah, an interesting choice, but they were gonna play win with defense. And then my last one, of course, Tampa Bay fan. I gotta put the Tampa Bay Lightning up at the, at the end here. They, uh, the Lightning are one of the teams that uses seven defensemen more regularly than other teams in the league. And they, for whatever reason, it's happened over multiple coaches. In 2004, John Tortorella, uh, when they won the cup with him, they used seven defensemen for about a third to a half of the playoff run. And then uh, 2011 here, conference finalist, uh, again with Guy Boucher as the coach. This structure kind of highlights why it can work for certain teams. Marc-Andre Bergeron is a power play specialist. They didn't want him on the ice during the uh, five on five as much as possible. And then of course they had Stamkos, Saint Louis, Le Cavalier, Simon Gagne. They had star players that if you give them extra ice time, uh, they can try and produce. So you don't necessarily need the fourth line to be complete. And then if you follow the recent years, John Cooper has used seven defensemen as well in the, the cup wins that we've had in the last, I wasn't a part of it, I shouldn't say we, they had from uh, 2020 and 2021. So I use them as my, my example for seven defensemen. So, finishing up, what have I learned? I learned that don't trust the NHL guide before 1982 in terms of the roster rules that are in there, because um, it was wrong about a, you know, a third of the time or so. Uh, the one thing I found really interesting is that if you looked at the 40 years before 1982, they had 19 different changes to their roster construction. It's been 40 years since they've changed anything, and I find it kind of curious that they haven't changed it because uh, it's an awful long time, and there hasn't really been much discussion of trying to go to a 19 or 20 skater roster, even though internationally that's what they've used now for 30 years. 
And so my guess is maybe now that with the salary cap, the existing players don't want to share the pie uh, with an extra player. And from the, the team's perspective, that would be another person you need to maintain and train and feed and, and not necessarily from a salary perspective anymore, but you'd still need the infrastructure to carry an extra roster spot. So uh, that's my theory as to why we haven't seen any larger rosters because I mean, we're getting to the point if you lose your sixth defenseman, you're at quite a disadvantage because the, the ice time is so is distributed, distributed so much more evenly than it would have been 40 or 50 years ago. So uh, that's it for me. I don't know what time we got, but we'll do questions and then we'll escape. Eric. The question is more of the deep about 